Hello and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk, an evening with George Singleton and Ron Rash. I'm Kate Whitman, Vice President of Author Programs and Community Engagement for the History Center, and I'm glad you're joining us this evening for what I'm certain is going to be a fun conversation. Copies of George's latest collection, You Want More, and Ron's collection, In the Valley, are available from our official bookselling partner, Acapella Books. That is at the link to the right of your screen in the chat box. Please submit your questions via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many of them as time allows. I'll pop back on towards the end of the conversation to facilitate the Q&A portion. And now to introduce our authors. George Singleton has published eight collections of stories, two novels, and a book of writing advice. Over 200 of his stories have appeared in magazines such as Atlantic Monthly, Harper's, Playboy, The Georgia Review, The Southern Review, The Cincinnati Review, and elsewhere. He's the recipient of a Pushcart Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Hillsdale Award from the Fellowship of Southern Writers, and the Corrington Award for Literary Excellence. He lives in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Ron Rash is the author of the Penn Faulkner finalist and New York Times bestselling novel, Serena. In addition to the critically acclaimed novels, The Risen, Above the Waterfall, The Cove, One Foot in Eden, Saints at the River, and The World Made Straight. He's also uh, the author of four collections of poems and six collections of stories, among them Burning Bright, which won the 2010 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award. Nothing Gold Can Stay, a New York Times bestseller, and Chemistry and Other Stories, which was a finalist for the 2007 Penn Faulkner Award. He has twice been the recipient of the O. Henry Prize and winner of the 2019 Sidney Lanier Prize for Southern Literature. He is Distinguished Professor in Appalachian Cultural Studies at Western Carolina University and lives in Clemson, South Carolina. George Singleton and Ron Rash, welcome. The Zoom room is yours. Thank you, Kate. All right, Ron, what are we going to do? Uh, well, I thought you had the plan, buddy. I think we need to start off with you were tell, starting off with some dog, uh, a dog excerpt. How's that sound? Okay, okay, I'm going to do that, and then you, you read something. I'm going to read this little bit, and then I'm going to tell a story about you and tell a story on both of us, okay? Okay. Okay, this is the beginning of a story called Probate. We didn't care really about the traveling euthanasia vet's failed marriage. We didn't care about why this woman showed up nine hours later than she said she'd arrive. I can't say all this for certain. I'll admit that I'm making some suppositions. I'd like to say that I could call Miranda and fact check this whole night, but she took off two days later without leaving much of a note and certainly not a new address. Her voicemail is full, so I can't leave a message saying, call me back so I can make sure I don't go around telling this story wrong. I can't even remember the vet's last name, though I remember her showing up, trailing along a rolling hard shell case of dog biscuit sedatives and animal heart stoppers. She came in, didn't make eye contact, and said her name was Dr. Nancy. She was one of those kind of vets, like a pediatric oncologist who took one too many humanities courses, or a fearful dentist specializing in adolescent pulpectomies, or a questionably intelligent recent seminary graduate intent on teaching a group why evil, famine, early death, spina bifida, multiple sclerosis, pain of water supply, cystic fibrosis, asthma, and muscular dystrophy exist in the world, not to mention AIDS, war, domestic violence, neuropathy, club feet, polio in the old days, death by handguns. She was one of those who thinks it necessary to go by first name only. Dr. Nancy, like Cher or Madonna, Oprah, LeBron, Jesus. Hey, I'm sorry I'm so late, but I got stuck on the phone with my therapist, this vet said. Miranda and I stood in our kitchen where our dog probate, lying sideways on the floor, panted, squealed, yelped, and practically pleaded, put me down now. Probate's real name happened to be Max. We'd inherited him inherited him when Miranda's mother died seven years earlier. Probate seemed to be a mix of chow and pit bull. He lived to at least 15 years old and his hips didn't respond daily. He was so black that no one would adopt him other than us we knew what with that fact about black dogs left forever at the pound. He had three tumors on his belly which meant when I tried to lift him he bit me. I'd do the same thing I said to Miranda. 
probate had res had responded to his new name right away, you could say, come here, Max, or come here, probate, and he'd do so. That F word would stare at me nonstop until I finally said, you want to go to the recycling center? I'd say, you want to go see Robin at the liquor store? I'd say, you want to drive over to Senor El Perro Caliente and get a wiener? He loved me and I him. A good dog is what I'm saying. If Miranda were here, she'd admit that the dog had quit eating a week before. Anyone with a rational side or a heart would understand that it was probate's time. My dog, probate. And then that story just kind of goes on and on and on throughout the thing. The reason why I'm reading this story, and this will be hard for y'all in attendance, if y'all are out there, because Ron and I can't see you, to, to, this will be hard to, under, to believe. But once upon a time, uh, I, Glenda and I had this dog named Marty. He lived to be 20 years old and then he died and I buried him in the backyard in Dacusville, South Carolina. And then one day about maybe two weeks later, I was out there and I started smelling something dead. Well, a couple of our younger dogs, we had a hope we had about 11 rescue at the time. They dug up poor old Marty. They had befouled his uh, gravesite. It was sad. And so I went and reburied him and put, tin, you know, tin roof on it and cement blocks and bricks. It was like bigger than, you know, pyramids in Egypt. So a couple days later, I was writing in my little writing room and my dog Dooley, my favorite dog, came in and drank a bunch of water and threw up and then drank a bunch of water and threw up. I went Dooley. So I went and put him in Glenda's art studio. So he quit doing it in my room. And he just got really sick. And I mean, like in two days, he lost a ton of weight. He wouldn't eat, maybe not even two days. So we took him to the emergency vet. It was Labor Day of 2000 and, mm, 2010, I think. So, Ron, you might know the date better than I. So um, I did an x-ray, and they said, he's got something in his, in his insides, and it was the towel. He had eaten that towel that had been wrapped around. He'd eaten the shroud around my dog, Dooley. Now, he had surgery cost $3,000. Everything came out okay. Week later, my buddy Ron Rash called and he said, how's it going? I said, not so hot. My dog Dooley ate a towel and had to get a surgery for $3,000. And Ron <laughs> said, are you making fun of me? And I went, no, I'm not making fun of you, Ron. What are you talking about? I had to take him to the emergency vet. You making fun of me. So the whole thing is his dog, Ahab, and I think eating a pair of your underwear, right? Yeah. Like boxer shorts. Same thing, same veterinarian, same amount of money. That veterinarian, his name was, her maiden name was BJ, Dr. BJ Hogg. I remember that because that's such an odd name. And a great vet that, whom we love. Um, but she probably has a beach house because of you and me. And uh, I, I think so. That's the reason why I wrote that little story about probate. All right, buddy, what you got? You got something from the, uh, from the uh, novella? Yeah, from the novel of the opening, uh, Serena comes back uh, into uh, North Carolina, uh, well, Miami first from uh, Brazil, and uh, I thought it'd be kind of fun to have her come in like a, a Valkyrie and out of the sky, uh, since she uh, is like that. So uh, <clears throat> this is her opening, and, and she actually gets interviewed at the end. There's a question asked, and it's by... Uh, Martha Gellhorn, who was married to Hemingway, she was a pretty intrepid uh, journalist uh, during World War II. When Serena Pemberton stepped out of the Commodore seaplane in July of 1931, a small but fervent contingent of reporters and photographers awaited her. Except for the pilot, she was alone. Those who would accompany her to the logging camp, both beast and human, had arrived by ship the night before. They were already on the train that would take them from Miami to North Carolina, all except for her minion Galloway, who procured an automobile to drive Serena to the station. As the metal ramp was ready, Galloway positioned himself beside the bottom step. He was short and wiry, shabbily dressed, a purple stump protruding from one sleeve, as cameras flashed mere inches from his face, he did not blink. As Serena descended, the first question shouted at her addressed the rumors surrounding her husband's death. For a moment, it didn't appear she would answer, but when her booted feet settled securely on the ground, 
The question was asked again, but with a caveat, had she loved her husband? I love my husband, but one always learns from disappointments. But what of his death, Mrs. Pemberton? And what of so many others of your acquaintance, the reporter asked. Logging is a dangerous business, she answered. Galloway was in front of her now, but Serena, almost a head taller, was clearly visible. He cleared the path as more questions came which she continued to fight against the National Park, in which she addressed the rumor that she was connected to the recent demise of Horace Kephart, the park's chief advocate. She opposed the Davis-Bacon Act. Why risk a transatlantic enterprise when she and her late husband had achieved so much in the States? Galloway opened the DeSoto's passenger door. Serena was about to get in when the sole woman in the group a reporter for the New Republic stepped close. She was very young, but like Serena, tall and blonde. When will you have achieved all your ambitions, Mrs. Pemberton, she asked, as others jostled around her. When the world and my will are one, Serena answered. Man, that, that last sentence is amazing. That's amazing. How do you like uh, writing a novella? That was fun. I, I, have you ever written one? I've written one, but I, it was a novel that just got, like everything, it seems like I write a lot of novels that get whittled down either into three stories or one novella. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it, that's, that was one, one reason this was fun to try to do one because, uh, you know, Dennis Johnson's Train Dreams is one of my favorite books. And yeah. that's, that's about as good a novella as I know, at least in America. Uh, but yeah, those, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh form. Uh, I mean, just how much room you've got, but it's, it, you know, it requires a lot of what you bring to a short story and then novel too. Yeah. All those Jim Harrison, um, yeah. all those Jim Harrison ones. And, and he's, I think he's the only writer. Well, I mean, I'm not horrifically well read, but I mean, he just wrote novella after novella after novella. I don't know anybody else who's got more than two or three uh, books of novellas, you know? Nah. Yeah. yeah. That, I love those books too. Yeah, certainly. Uh, okay, so you, uh, are we going to start telling lies about each other now? Yeah, I think it's about time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm the straight man in all this, you know. I, yeah, go ahead there. Uh, uh, okay, I'm going to tell this story. Uh, I've been talking about it a lot. For some reason, you know, people already know that you and I have known each other for a while. I don't think they know that we've known each other since I think probably that we first met in about 1973, maybe, 73 yeah. or 74. When yeah. were you a freshman in college? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I think 73 would be right. Yeah. 73 or 74. Yeah, I was 15. Um, and Ron was only 15. He went to college. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, <laughs> actually, I've been saying that you were 35 when I'm uh, out. <laughs> and, uh, and I had this buddy who I ran. I was a runner. And... He went to Gardner Webb where Ron went and and my buddy Philip Snotty um, said, and I guess you and Philip, were you and Philip roommates? I forget. No, just friends. I mean, well, we were on the team together, yeah. On the team, yeah. So, um, I mean, I couldn't even drive yet. My parents drove me off, it was a different time, left me off at this college. And I would stay there and, and, and learn from Coach Bill Freeman. Was that yeah. right? Yeah. Um, do you remember, were you at that scene? And Coach Freeman often would say to my buddy Philip, tell that little guy George when he comes to visit to bring fireworks because you could get him in South Carolina. And one night we were shooting, this is so ecologically wrong. We were shooting fireworks into, I guess it's called the Broad River. Broad that, River, yeah. Uh, on a bridge, and shooting it into the water and watching the flash underwater and the... Um, the police showed up, a sheriff's deputy, and I, Ron, you were there, I think, and we yeah. went running. We just went running, hit on the cops. I was like 15 or something. We went running, tripped over a 55-gallon drum, fell into briars that just cut us to pieces. Um, and that, and that's and then that's how Ron and I met back, you know. Yeah. And uh, Nixon was still president. It's a long time ago. Then I guess we didn't see each other again until. <clears throat> Gosh, about 1988 or 89 or something like that at, at Francis Marion when I was teaching yeah. there and there was a, you were there with your brother Tom and um, 
then soon thereafter, I, you know, I moved to the upstate and you were living in Pendleton. We lived 20 miles apart and saw, saw each other, uh, you know, for you way too often, you know, <laughs> kids were little, uncle George is in town. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you got to tell the story where you outed me. Oh, <laughs> the great, terrible man that you are. Um, once upon a time, Ann Rash, this is uh, Ron's uh, better half, said to me, "I don't think I don't think Ann would be upset that I said this. She was she'd had a couple glasses of wine, and she she doesn't drink often or or anything." And uh, she said, "You know, George, what Ron's." father wanted to name him and Ron said don't you tell that and don't you tell him he's going to use it against me don't you tell him don't you tell him <laughs> so I like I'm a mule so I went I will find out a way and I will remember this so a couple years went by and Ron and his son James and I were eating lunch we kind of met met halfway and easily or near easily somewhere I don't know what was going on, but I said to James, you know, James, that your grandfather wanted to name your daddy Lester or whatever I said. And James said, I thought he wanted to name you Rembrandt. And I went, I win, I win. I figured it out. And, and, and Ron was just like, damn you, you know, you let on. Um, so then that maybe is what happened to lead on to, a lot of people have asked me about this too you and I may be putting each other's last names in each other's stories. And I've done this. I don't see it in, in the Valley. I know we had a truce. So maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe we quit. Um, but you know, there's a Georgina Singleton. I mean, I get so many emails like, Hey, did you know your name shows up as, you know, you got whip worms and you can't <laughs> pay for them. And I, yeah, I know, I know. You know, I've put things in there about Ron that a lot of it can't be repeated in um, polite company, but, um, but it's been fun. It's been well, yeah, you've got an advantage with a name like Rash. You know, you can, you can have oh, a lot yeah. of fun and with I, that. And I've put a Rembrandt Rash in the story. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think I made that character a, uh, a taxidermist who made who, um, a taxiderm Rembrandt Rash, a taxidermist who um, specialize in jackalopes. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. these things are. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What you working on now? Oh man, uh, I'm, I'm writing, uh, actually writing a short story. Uh, I, you know, uh, it's kind of weird time. I've been trying to, you know, write, I've got something longer I was working on, but it just kind of died on me. But, uh, yeah. you know, that's kind of one thing I think that's been interesting, uh, how we, I think we both kind of used what we learned from running, uh -huh. kind of made that transition into writing. Cause I think, uh, we both, have a lot of stuff a lot of writing we probably will never publish but you know we kind of uh go at it every day pretty much most days i think it's a, i think it's a great analogy because you know you have you have running days where you just aren't doing so hot but if you don't do it if you don't run you know every day you're not going to get better you know if i if i run today well not me but if a new if a newbie runs today might run a mile it runs every day. They're going to be those bad shin splints and bad, you know, aches and pains. At the end of a year, that person's going to be able to run certainly a half marathon or something like that. And it's the same way with writing where you got kind of your bad days and you say, oh, to hell with that. But if you don't keep writing, you ain't going to get any better, right? Uh, and I think, you know, uh, that idea of waiting for inspiration, you know, I, I don't buy that romantic idea. No, uh, no. Um, it's a lot of time of waiting. That would be just, that's like waiting for Godot. I mean, that would just be forever and ever waiting. Yeah. I think it's interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, when Ron and I, um, when I first moved up back to the upstate in 1992, and Ron was living in Pendleton, and I was living in Dacusville, um, and we get, and, you know, that was a time when you and I remember this to this day, you know, you and I and uh, Bart Barton and Dale Ray Phillips would get together you know, once a week, once every couple of weeks. And I remember days when you and I would go like, man, I got some good news today. I got a rejection from you know, whatever the Southern review. And they, they said, send something back. I mean, we, we you know, both of us were so yeah. happy back then. You were, you no, know, you, you put out a book of stories early, but you know, I, I, I made fun of you more for being a poet. Back yeah. Then, you know, um, yeah. 
what the hell. Uh, yeah, Dale, you know, Dale had kind of already published in Atlantic, and, uh, you know, he taught me so much about storytelling. Yeah, yeah, me too. I think he taught both of us. I mean, every, I can hear his voice. For those of y'all don't know, this is Dale Ray Phillips wrote a, a linked collection called uh, My People's Waltz, and and they're, um, they're all like first person retrospective. And that's what I learned from him. That book came out in 1998. I'm a slow learner, but I, in about 1999, I started writing those stories to go. When I was uh, eight years old, I had this crazy father and, and they're just fun to write. You know, you get to use an adult voice, but looking back at a naive, puzzled child, you know, and it's uh, kind of fun. Uh, yeah, and I think what Dale showed me, I mean, you remember we would go into his apartment <laughs> uh, which your Glenda said, remind, you know, that great quote about uh, Madame Curie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but we'd go in there, and Dale did, just had a typewriter. He didn't have a computer. And, and it looked like a popcorn machine had been in that room where he wrote because he would write a sentence and ball it up. And there'd be like 300 of these balls. Yeah, yeah. Just that idea of the perfect sentence. And he, he had some. I mean, he had that great line opening i i may get it a word or two off but it's my my grandmother no my grandfather kept his mistress in a silver airstream above the bend of the river where the dead cross it's one of the most beautiful yeah. lines i've ever read yeah and so uh, why i why i started talking is the uh, name of that story yeah yeah he also and I, you know i'm the opposite kind of writer you know what i do is get it all out, you know, okay, it took me a week to write that story and then go back and kind of clean it up. And Dale, to this day, will, you know, call me up and say, uh, hey, I want to read you something. And I'll say, okay, and he'll read it. And I'll say, Dale, you read me that very same paragraph like six months <laughs> ago. And he'll, I did not, you know, get really mad. I did not. I changed the to A or, <laughs> you know, I changed the woman's name or whatever. I mean, he was yeah. so slightly anal retentive about these things yeah. i'm more uh just get it out just get it all out and clean it up later you know well i'm, I'm more like that too i mean i just you know to me i just want to i'm it's kind of like a potter you know i just want to get so, a big gob of clay and and start messing with it yeah 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 uh the story about glenda we were just talking about this uh yesterday i think um dale was complaining and he had this just terrible terrible he never mopped or swept or anything his apartment in clemson and he was complaining i can't find a girlfriend i can't find a girlfriend and glenda went in to use the restroom and came out and said the only girlfriend you're ever going to find is madame curie <laughs> who visits your your bathroom i remember yeah, that I had like mold growing all over yeah. the walls and i remember he got bit by a spider in there you know there were spiders <laughs> going around there and but uh, uh, you know, it was so funny. The first time I saw him, he was dead drunk. He, he just quit drinking. And, uh, but he was in, uh, it was, where was it? Tiger? It was one of those bar, Nick's. Yeah. And Clemson, yeah, yeah. And he uh, was screaming at the top of his voice. It was a Duke, North Carolina basketball game on. And you told me about him and said, just if you see him, stay away. And I thought, this guy's insane. <laughs> And I didn't, you know, it was like a rabid dog in there. And then, it, you know, when you get to know him, he's probably as sensitive a person as I've ever met. First time Glenda met him, I think she threw a set of car keys at him because he was just yeah. cussing and telling him, just being rude. And then he, he blinks, you know, he's got like granulated eyelids or whatever. And he, he's blinking real bad. And he went, did I say something wrong? Did I say something wrong? <laughs> yeah, man. Dale, you, and, and my, uh, I actually, when, you know, sometimes y'all come over to my place in Pendleton and we get on the porch and James would come out there and Caroline and Dale, you know, every other word was, you know, the F word or, I mean, he just, yeah, just cursing and cursing. And, uh, you know, I, I, I go in there after it and I said, you know, we love Dale. <laughs> I want to talk like him. <laughs> You know, those kids, the kids were just so solemn about it. Well, here's something I thought would be funny. I, I've never asked you this, but I know you got something good. But uh, I was going to ask you about the the most obnoxious comment where, where somebody said you got something wrong because I've got a really funny story about that. I uh, When I, I published The World Made Straight, I, I think I've told you this story. Maybe not. But uh, uh, I, there's a 
scene in that novel where, in, you know, 1863, there was a Civil War massacre up in North Carolina mountains, and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, there 13 men and, men and boys were killed by, uh, they were, you know, Union sympathizers, but anyway, I was doing research, and, and, and every account, including 1863 New York Times and, and a book written about the massacre, said that the last person killed was a 12-year-old boy. And uh, so when I published it, I guess about a month after the book came out, I got this very condescending voice calling me. And he said, well, you, you know, there's always somebody out there wanting you to get something wrong. And he said, I can't wait, can't wait. Yeah, and, and he said, well, I, I just want to let you know, uh, Mr. Rash, that uh, that detail about the 12-year-old boy was wrong. He wasn't the last kill. And I said, well, you know, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the sources I'd looked at, and I said, well, what, what was your source? And, he, and I, this, I swear this is true. He said, well, my team of paranormal investigators went up to the grave site and the ghost told us that he was, the man said I was the last one killed. So, you know, we finally get some information from the other world and it's not a cure for COVID. <laughs> Page 219, Ron Rash got this wrong. I don't have anything that, the worst thing that happened to me well, there are always people say like, you know, you mentioned this street in this town and there is no street, guys, I know, I just made it up. But the worst was, um, that I can think off the top of my head is, uh, at a story, it came out in Playboy magazine, it didn't have any cuss words, and it mentioned, and it was taking place at, uh, at Camp Skyuga, you know, up in uh, near Columbus, North Carolina, which you and I and Dale have a story about that. Um, it was fiction. It was 100% fiction. But the narrator said there was a woman living, it's in first person, living across from me who was beautiful but crazy. Well, I was up there. Glenda and I were up there. We were working. I was working on, you know, underpinning of the stupid cabin or whatever. I had a big framing hammer in my hand. And this woman came. She was crying. And she's also uh, was big. She liked to be in those little theater productions in that area. And she said, you have upset me and you've upset my husband terribly because you wrote about me, blah, 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 and all that. I said, I wasn't writing about you. You know, what are you talking about? She went on and on and on. I said, I said this woman was beautiful, but crazy. So half of it is right, but the other half is not right. <laughs> Get off my property. And I had this, <laughs> I was shaking, you know, she went storming off and never saw her again. And they moved to the West Coast. So good. Yeah. That, place, that place I was kind of in my mind writing about was that place where one July, you and I and Dale Ray Phillips and James went fishing. For some reason, it was about 55 degrees. It was cold and it was real foggy. And Dale was cussing a whole lot. Dale, I should mention, is five feet tall. And he cast out there and he was blankety blank, 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 blankety blank. I've caught the world record bass, blankety blank. He's going on and on. He's got this world record bass and he had snagged up a grass carp which was a big old fish, oh, yeah. but he couldn't get the thing in. And I had to go trade that, you know, walk out in the lake, grab that thing by the lip. And these are prehistoric weirdo looking uh, fish and bring the thing in. I think he, I think he took a, a, a scale off of it. The scales are as big as a silver dollar or something like yeah. that. Well, you know, James and, uh, and uh, Ivy both, uh, you know, we let them bring it, you know, bring mm -hmm. uh, play, play it too. I mean, it took That's right. 20 minutes to get it to shore. Yeah, I remember that. That's fun. Fun. Yeah. Yeah. So those were good good days. Yeah, uh, we're still alive. Yeah. And we're talking while people are eavesdropping on us, which is a little bit like romper room, except we can't see anybody. That's right. There's Kate. Do you want to bring them into the conversation? Because there's a lot of chatter if you're uh, ready. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna start with some comments if that's okay. A lot of people have dog stories. Um, one said that their dog had, let's see, three ACL surgeries. So they changed its name to Chipper Jones. John said that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh, I love it. Whoever said that, give Chipper my love. <laughs> well, my um, best dog, my best dog story. I got to tell this real quick is I, I had this mean dog. It, George knows. I mean, George is good with dogs named Pepper. And I'm meanest, meanest dog in all all time. Yeah, it was just a horrible dog. 
And whenever anybody would come to the house, we'd have to keep it, uh, you know, kind of uh, pinned up. But anyway, Caroline was going on like her first date. And, you know, she was getting ready as a big deal in the family. And the guy came and knocked on the door, rang the doorbell. And we forgot to, you know, put the beast up. And, and so I was going to the door. When I opened the door, that dog just bolted right out and went right for this guy's crotch, <laughs> right for it. And just kind of, you know, just kind of raked the, skip of the uh, uh, zipper. And I looked at the kid and I said, I taught him that. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I'm, I'm so proud of, you know, I want to be like St. Francis of Assisi. So every time I'd go over there, I'd go, I said, don't mess with Pepper. Said, Come here, Pepper. Pepper and I would be friends. And Pepper would be scared, and then, then you'd hear, and then, and bite my hand, you know. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, well, Tim said, and I agree, because Zoom kept telling me that my mic was off as I was cackling and laughing at everything you were saying. But Tim just wanted to say that you're both pretty funny, and you write your asses off. So that's, that's pretty My nice. Tim. Thank you. Tim, Tim Peel. <laughs> Um, okay, so there's lots and lots of questions. Let me start with um, a question from Worth Parker. Um, how do you handle dialogue and dialect without making it campy? And he said he's asked, he asked Clyde Edgerton this as well. Go ahead, George. Oh, I do it. Um, you know, it's a little bit old fashioned to say like, I'm going down to the river like Mark Twain might write. You can, you can put a sentence before the dialogue that gives, sorry, I'm smoking like crazy. Um, I normally don't smoke either. Um, you can put a sentence before the dialogue that'll give the reader, the reader's ear, a sense of how this person's going to sound. So if you wrote, um, when, when uh, Vincent spoke, it sounded like he tried to juggle razor blades in his mouth. He said, I'm going down to the river. The reader knows, oh, if you're juggling razor blades, it's going to sound like I'm going down to the river like that, you know, but that, that stuff about, I'm just kind of against, I mean, I, you know, people do it and, and that's okay, but, but it, for me, if I'm spending more time trying to figure out what the heck someone is trying to say, you know, one time up in New York, um, this editor of mine's wife said, what's that word you, you people in the South use called unset? And I went, I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, it's in Faulkner all the time, onset, O-N-C-E-T. And I went, oh, well, that's once, like, yeah, once, once yeah. twice, three times a lady, you know. So if, if the reader's having to stop, it's probably not a good sign. Yeah, I think, you know, I use a lot, particularly, you know, when I'm writing about the past, but not always then. I use, I, I do want to give a sense of the way that the language is spoken, but at the same time, I think to me, it's not that you're trying, it's not mimicry, it's more translation. I mean, you're, you're, you're not making it as dialectical as it might be in reality even, because you don't want the reader to, you don't want it to be a distraction. You know, what Ron does really well, especially in, in something that's a little bit more historical, like if he's writing about Serena, it's the words those characters are using and the way they juxtapose those words that, that let us know, first of all, they're cool, but also, this is just a different time, and there, and you can just kind of tell, you know, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a perfect sentence, but, but um, that's how to do it. That's how I do it. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think you know we, I mean, dialogue is. I, I enjoy writing dialogue. It's kind of fun. Yeah. Oh, it's great fun. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, so Teresa Weaver has a question that Patty Henry also has asked, which is, has the pandemic affected your writing process at all? And Teresa actually also wants to know if you'll, if you think you'll ever write about this particular time in our lives. Go Ron. Uh, well, you know, I actually COVID had an influence on uh, um, the novella in, in the valley uh, of this book, this new book, because it was it was striking when I was finishing it up, and uh, the COVID was in you know the country, and I actually have a scene uh, you know where I use the 1918 flu epidemic as a you know which was had happened to uh, uh, cost uh, uh, one of the characters his family, so I, you know I, I was kind of aware of that, and I hope brought some of that into it. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm writing, but I think in some ways I'm writing almost, uh, I, I, it hasn't really disrupted my writing. I think I need it just to, to get out of, out of it, out of this, you know, to get, it gives me a chance to get, to move out of this reality, you know, kind of into my head and imagination. I don't know. What about it to you? I mean, are you, has it, you know, I, started, I, started, I started off, you know, writing, it didn't, didn't matter. And then I found myself, I'm just really um, obsessed with it. And I've noticed that, you know, I just, I finished a story yesterday, a first draft of it or something. And I, and they were wearing masks. I mean, I was kind of doing a story about a woman rehabbing a house and the guy, a stranger coming up, not wearing a mask. I'm also dreaming about not wearing a mask and that's uh, trouble. But um, so um, great Teresa, thank you. And, and for Patty Henry, I'm writing a, a, a novel now about the granddaughter of C.S. Lewis wearing a mask and, uh, and there's a mess with Patty. She's, she'll kill me on this one later. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, we know Patty. She's a fine writer. So. Oh yeah. We're both 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 of those. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, there seems to be some great short story collections released recently. Do you guys think that they're making a comeback? That's from John. Well, I am always optimistic about it, and there have been some great ones. Like Ron and I know this uh, writer named Leah Hampton, who's written a novel that we can't say on. Uh, in you know, it's F word face. It's got an asterisk in there. That's a that's a master class in first lines. I mean, every first line of that story goes directly into the conflict. It's perfect. Um, it's been a bunch of great novels too. But um, you know, I always think they're going to make a comeback, but boy, they don't. I, you know, I don't get it. You would think with attention spans and yeah. stuff that. Uh, you would think that haiku would be a bestseller list right now. What do you think, Ron? Well, I I, I keep hoping too. I think there's an audience out there, but it, they do seem just perfect. And and it's interesting that for some reason, you know, a lot of times people won't even consider reading them. And I think once they do, they kind of realize, well, yeah, this this can fit. And I, I I would argue that you know it's our great contribution to world literature. I mean you know Poe Faulkner, Clay, yeah. Carver. I mean you know uh, so it's something we do well. Uh, but I love them. I and I think it's the hardest. I, I write poetry and novels. And I think writing a, a good short story is much harder. I think it's hard to write. It's, it's easy to write a bad novel. I've done a bunch of those. It's hard to get a really good short story where you're going, oh man, that this eighth sentence depends on the seventh, depends on the mm. sixth, fifth. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, like a good man is hard to find. I, I mean, you can't, you can't pull a sentence out of that story. No. It's no. So tight. Uh, and I've been rereading Chekhov lately and uh, I wish I could read him in Russian because he's evidently a great stylist. And, mm. but, Man, I, I've kind of been blown away by him recently. I, you know, I've always, I've never quite really thought he was that good, but I, maybe it's what's happening with COVID, but there's something there that is just knocking me out. I've been rereading, there's a new translation, uh, 52 stories, and I've been kind of going through that. Yeah. You like him? I'm, I'm like you. I'm, I'm not in love with, you know, there are a whole lot of writers, short story writers that like check off his blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Uh, like people say about Faulkner or something, I go, well, ah, okay, Chekhov's, you know, I read a Chekhov story recently, it had to do with gambling, and that was really good, but I went, I, I don't know, uh, you know, I've been reading Richard Yates again, and I think that guy, uh, and John Cheever, you know, is just, yeah. is perfect, I mean, those are just, and Flannery O'Connor, forget it, you know, that's, those are perfect stories, you know. Yeah, Cheever, I, I don't know if, if people are kind of forgetting about him, but he's got some of the stories that, uh, I mean, my, what, what's the one about the brothers? Uh, uh, what is that one? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, it's called, he's got one called The Brothers, I think, doesn't he? Uh, Country Husband, Enormous Radius. Yeah, it's, it's the one where the, where the, the women are, are, are I go out into the ocean. They come out at the end of the story. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, uh, no. I mean, Cheever just uh, yeah, he's amazing. Farewell, my brother. Is that yeah, it? 
That's Dale it. Ray. Yeah. Who we? I thought the brain cells were dead, but that one came out. Yeah, Dale Ray really kind of turned us on that. Remember, he would quote lines from those stories, those two yeah. stories. Yeah. 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 Perfect. Right, I, so these were sent to me earlier, and they're just too odd to not ask you. Um, what do you keep in your pockets when doing a public reading? And also, do you have any rituals about remaining hydrated when working? Those are from David. So what do you keep in your pockets, or if anything, during a reading? And then do you have any rituals about remaining hydrated while working? Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I keep my car keys in my pocket <laughs> when reading in case I need to run the hell out of there and drive off fast and hydrated, uh, you know. I wonder if that's them asking if you drink while you write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gee, I wonder. Well, I actually, I what I drink I is, do. um, I drink. I get a bit, I, you know, I'm kind of ritualistic. I don't know if you are, George, but I like to have certain things before I start. And one is I have like a 48 ounces of uh, tea. Uh, you know, I hate to do this being a Southerner, but now you know, I've had to go to unsweeten. But, you know, I just kind of, I think it's kind of like, you know, you smoke, sometimes you smoke cigarettes. I don't smoke, but I think you need something tactile to kind of touch. Yeah. And, and that does that for me. Yeah, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, coffee matters, matters what time of day, and it matters where I am in the story. I can tell you this, I rewrite really sober. I mean, really, really sober rewrite. And in case anybody, because Kate brought this up, I'm not sitting in a bathroom. It's nothing <laughs> like a bathroom. But my, my toilet doesn't have these ends, you know, this chair. It's just, it's just a little alcove where at least I got some kind of light in this house. <laughs> Well, it looks like the cabinet of Dr. Caligari or something. I, yeah, 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 with your 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 books all on a slant. <laughs> the leaning the leaning bookcase. That's great. Let's see. Um, George, how did you decide on the stories that were selected for this collection? Uh, that's a good question. Um, in a weird way, this has to do with Ron. Ron has a uh, uh, selected that I think has 30 stories. And Meg Reed, the editor, said, pick out 30 stories. So I did. And... And then I thought, you know, because I'm more comfortable writing in first person and 30 first person stories is pretty brutal, I thought. So I went back and, you know, I've had, a, I just don't like to write in third. I like reading everybody else's third person. But when I write in third person, it sounds like an essay to me. It sounds, something's wrong. So uh, I picked out a bunch of first person, about nine um, third person and a couple second person. And I just said, put them in any way you want, you know, they're not in, um, they're not chronological, they're just kind of jumped around. So there'll be, actually the first first story is, excuse me, in third person. And then there's a few first person and then a third. And the only one I worried about was the, uh, the last one. It's called What Could Have Been, it's in second person. It's a kind of a shortish story. And since a lot of my stories are about small town Southerners wanting their, wanting their uh, towns to uh, revi revitalize. And that last story is kind of, kind of, uh, be careful what you wish for, or you're going to end up with yeah. a bunch of parties, uh, Burger King, stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I love that last story. I thought that, you know, early, before we came on, I was actually talking about it. I think that was the perfect story to end with. I mean, it just sums up that whole world. Uh, you know, a lot of the stories have taken place in, but also it's just so beautifully written. I mean, there's a beautiful rhythm to it. And, uh, yeah, thanks, man. last image is, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm glad you finished with that one. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So a cut I kind of combine a couple questions. Um, it, basically about your mentors. So who were your uh, writing mentors and someone in particular, Natalia asked about Bill Kuhn's influence on both of you. Go ahead, a bigger influence on Ron. Go Ron. Well, Bill Kuhn changed my life. Uh, I went to Clemson. Uh, <clears throat> I wasn't even sure if I should belonged in graduate school. And um, uh, he kind of took me under uh, his wing. He, he entered, you know, he did that. One, one thing he really did that was wonderful was that he introduced me to writers that I would not have uh, read on my own. And he actually told, eight, I don't know if you know this, but he told 18th century. Yeah. He actually made, he made me 
or he made me love the 18, you know, the 18th century. And, and actually, I still do. I mean, Samuel Johnson and Swift. But Bill uh, was the best teacher I've ever had. I mean, um, I, and, 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 and I actually, the way I teach is pretty much just straight, straight, you know, straight imitation of him. Um, and he just uh, always supported me. Um, he, he looked after me. He actually got me the job at Tri-County Tech. Uh, and uh, I, I, I miss him terribly. I mean, we both do. Uh, but yeah, he was uh, one of the best people I've ever known and, and certainly the best teacher. And uh, wow, uh, he, he I, I would not be the writer, nearly the writer, you know, whatever I am, uh, whatever's good in it. He's had a huge part of it. He's a great storyteller too. Yeah. I mean, just a great, a big, big heart. I mean, he was, um, he was a big, a good cheerleader for both of us. Uh, yeah. I miss him too. I didn't know Bill. I mean, I met him through, through you, Ron. Yeah. Um, my mentor, my, my professors were um, a man named Gilbert Allen at Furman, who was just patient as patient can be. And I probably needed that or I would have just gone off crying in the corner. And then a guy named Richard Bausch, he's a great writer. And the thing about the, my, and a guy named Fred Chapel, and uh, a, a professor uh, and a great writer named Lee Zacharias, all of them just kind of let me go. And no one told me how to get published. Like no one said, oh, by the way, you probably need to send this off to an agent or editor because they probably knew that I would not be I mean, I didn't have my first book till I was 41 or something like that. I had a bunch of stories published. And I was being a little bit hard-headed about writing stories. But um, the thing about, and, and all of them pointed, like Gilbert Allen, right away, <laughs> we had to do these like oral reports or something. And he gave me this crazy story by Donald Barthelme called A Shower of Gold about this artist named Peterson. And the president of the United States comes to him with a sledgehammer. And I went, you know, I've been reading like what in high school, like Wuthering Heights and Charles Dickens. I'm like, what the heck is this all about? And why do I love it so much? Uh, kind of that absurdist uh, stuff. So there's that. When it comes to, uh, I think Mr. Rash, my good buddy, would say that a big influence on him as a writer was uh, like Thomas Wolfe when he read yeah. uh, Thomas Wolfe. For me, uh, because I'm from Greenwood, South Carolina, we didn't have a bookstore. We didn't really have a library, anything like that. Well, you run didn't either in Boiling Springs. Um, but my big mentor there was Henry Gibson. He was on this TV show called Laughing. <laughs> He'd come out with this big flower and say these poems. And I love that guy to death and would kind of mimic. Uh, I was doing meta poetry, I think, or fan poetry back then. I was like 12. And that brings up a good point. I think both of us went a long time before we published our first books. And I think that was a good thing in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, um, I, you know, I think we worked hard. We got our, you know, really worked on our craft and, you know, and, and just got, you know, we just kind of uh, persevered and, slow, you know, from uh, speaking of myself, I mean, slowly got better. I mean, I, you yeah. know, I wrote a lot of really bad stuff early on. And, uh, but I'm kind of glad the way it worked out because once you, you do get some attention, I mean, that really starts, if you're not careful, that can get in, get in the way. I mean, you know, people start wanting stuff and, uh, I think, think about all those 20 thing to be in oblivion for a while. Yeah. There's a lot of 24 year old, uh, writers who make a big splash and then you just really never hear of that person again until it's a early obituary. Um, yeah. Not everybody. I mean, there's a bunch of great writers who have done really well, but um, you're right. I'd be dead. If I, if I would have had a first book when I was 25 or 26, phew, I'd be dead by now. Uh, all right. That, that's, um, I was going to say, that feels that's uplifting, Kate. Thanks. Well, I have one more. I have one more. And then, um, but first, let me remind everybody that Acapella is our official bookstore for tonight. Um, and they're selling copies of You Want More and In the Valley. But buy it from any independent bookstore. I mean, really important right now. The last question is about what you all think about being called 
a southern writer does that bother oh. you <laughs> is, that the, is that always the last question ron asked that one. Oh, you there are a lot of people calling you yeah. rembrandt in the chat by the way just <laughs> well, <thank you>. yeah <laughs> i win again i win <laughs> yeah I'm, i'll be the oh at my funeral i'll still be the straight man i, I can see that yep yep yeah. so southern writer does it does it impact you? Or are you just, I mean, it's, it is where we live. It is where you're working. How do you, do you have any opinion? Well, I've, I've said some, you know, uh, sometimes people misconstrue what I say. I, and and what, yeah, I'm very proud to be a Southern writer. I'm proud of that tradition. The writers, O'Connor, Faulkner, those writers, Wolf. I mean, and so I'm very proud of that. My only problem is that I think and it's not so much within the South, but outside, particularly in New York, is that, that often there's an implied just a Southern writer. That's where I have a bit of a problem. George? Yeah, I have that problem. And also, and, and the, the times when I bet Ron and I are asked that question is when we're outside of the South. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're in like Iowa or Pacific Northwest. Every time I've been on book tours somewhere outside of the South, someone in the Q&A has said, are you a Southern writer? Now, how I interpret that is, are you going to go get drunk and act fool yeah. right after this thing is going on? To which I say, yeah, yeah, I probably am. Uh, watch out. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm serious. And, you, know, I, you know, it's like this. Who cares? You know, we're just writing. And if it's a, if it's a, um, if we're, if we're, if Ron and I are doing our jobs well, uh, somebody in Maine can read it and say, oh, I, I you know, Ron's got a, um, short story in this collection called Lum, oh, what's it called? Lum, La Home Blessé. Uh, Lum, Lum Blessé. And it's about someone, oh, oh, someone contacting her old art history professor and saying, you know, I got this kind of crazy uncle who's painted some weird stuff on the inside of his cabin and they're about to destroy the cabin. We come look at it. I think someone in Maine, and so he's like an outside artist where he saw something in World War II in a cave, you know, like around Lascaux or whatever. Somebody in Maine can say, you know, I got a crazy uncle who's painted crazy stuff on the wall too. It doesn't have to be the South, you know, so. And I, even though, you know, the term regional writer, I always find it amusing that uh, to me, uh, some of the most provincial writing I've ever read is by writers such as uh, Jay McInerney. I mean, you know, it's upper class whites in Manhattan. That's about as provincial as you can get. So I always find that kind of funny that it's, you know, who, who's regional, who's not. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are very happy that you are from the South and that we can claim you as our own. So George Singleton, Ron Rash, thank you both so much. Thank you all for joining us. Hey, help out Frank Reese at uh, Acapella. That's a great bookstore. Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, yeah, goodbye, Independent. Yeah. Hi, y'all. Thanks all. again. Bye. Hi, y'all. Bye, Ron. Bye. See you later, buddy. I'll talk to you soon, man. Okay.